Let's just remain standing for a few moments as we read God's Word. I was thinking of all that introduction I'd really have to live a real life to live that up, wouldn't I? That's man that loved you. Over in the book of St. Luke, the 19th chapter, I want to read just a portion of the scripture, the first five verses. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which had, was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And he could not for the press, because he was little of statue. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, all murmured, saying that he was gone to be the guest of a man which was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to Thee this morning because You are still seeking to save the sons of Abraham, that which is lost. We pray, Heavenly Father, that You will receive our humble prayer and bless our gathering together here today. And may it not be in vain, but may the great Holy Spirit teach us the way of life knowing this, that we must stand in His presence someday to give an account of what we've done with this life. Bless us together now as we further wait on Thee. In Jesus' name, Amen. I am sure happy to have good friends, people who believe and believe the efforts that you're trying to put forth. If I had any other objective, just merely to be different, why, I would be a, a real sinner. But my objective is to magnify Jesus Christ. And something that's in a man, when you have a message from God... You cannot stop yourself. There's something in you pulsating. It goes on anyhow. You can slow it up, stop it, or start it. It stops and starts and slows up you. See, it's the one that has control. Thanks to to these fine brethren for their testimony of our Lord Jesus. They weren't speaking of me, of course not. They were speaking of him. I was reading a little article here not long ago about Mr. Moody said uh, Chicago was going to, newspapers go to write an editorial on him. And they sent a, someone out to find out why people gathered to hear Mr. Moody. And the editorial, Mr. Moody is like myself. He didn't have enough education to read the, the editorial, so his manager had to read it. Mr. Moody was a shoe cobbler formerly, and he was called of God for a message of his, the hour. And... So the manager was reading the editorial and said, Why would anybody go to hear Dwight Moody? Said, In the first place, he's the ugliest man i ever seen. And said, He's bald-headed and long whiskers and so forth. And said, And he, he whines when he talks. His grammar is the worst I ever heard. <laughs> and oh, he's just carrying on like that. Said, Mr. Moody just shrugged his shoulders and said, Certainly not to come to see Christ. <laughs> so that's, yeah. I think that's just the answer. Yeah, yeah. It's Christ that we that's want it. to see. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I was thinking after visiting here in the the city and finding it, uh, the people, how nice they've been, what a nice meeting we're having here at the Denham Springs High School or school auditorium. I was thinking the people here are something like the coffee. There. (laughs) My. It's a... 
Not quantity, but it's quality. <laughs> Yes, sir. A whole lot more than cuts. <laughs> I remember my first time landing at the airport out here. The brothers coming to get me, sitting here, and a little French girl there. I asked for a hamburger and a cup of coffee. I never drank it till I was about 38 years old. I ought to know it better. But then Brother Brown, I guess he's here this morning somewhere. He's sitting right here. He liked it so well. He got me. I'd have a ministerial breakfast at 7 o'clock, one at 8 o'clock, one at 9 o'clock. You couldn't eat all that, so they pour coffee, and I got to sip it, and the first thing I got to drink it. So I asked this girl, I told her I want a hamburger and a cup of coffee. When they brought the little cup out, I thought, my, my, they sure tied on their coffee right there. <laughs> first drink, first swallow I took, oh, my, I had to fight for bread. <laughs> that little lady said, you must be a Yankee. <laughs> she said, I'll pitch you a Yankee cup. <laughs> So that's where I find the people. Maybe not the greatest crowds I've ever spoke to, but real genuine quality. I'm grateful for that. A listening audience, somebody who sets and pays attention to what you're saying. Uh, what's what I want you to do. Examine what a man says by the Word of God. And if it isn't right, then it isn't right. That's all. If it is the Word of God, then God's got to testify of His Word because He promised to. So that's why we like to examine these things to to find out. Now, I understood this morning that this was a, to be a businessman's breakfast. And uh, uh, the Full Gospel Businessman, which I'm a member of their chapter, and I think this, they said some of them was here. Some of them didn't get out. Maybe their businessman, they got the, uh, their business they have to tend to. I'm going to give them an excuse anyhow. So, so that's how I said many of their people were here anyhow. So that's, very fine. I'm just a little joke. I've told it, but maybe it's not a place to joke, of course, but it's just a little sense of humor. When you talk like we've been a while ago, well, maybe get people back on some sense of humor. I remember <clears throat> one time a friend and I were in school together. His name's Wilmer Snyder. His brother's a Baptist minister, and he, he writes in this upper room, a, a column in the upper room. We were schoolboys together, and I studied the ministry, and he um, he become an insurance agent. And so uh, he uh, come to my house one day to visit me, and uh, there may be some insurance agent here, and I'm not saying nothing about insurance now. I hope you don't think wrong of this, but you catch the little hang of what I, the way I said it. So my brother also is, uh, has the uh, prudential, and he sells uh, prudential insurance. So one time I had a little something done by an insurance company that I'm, I guess, not knowing very much, I they read the policy to me wrong, and it was misrepresented to me, and I just never did take it out. I, so one day Wilmer come up to see me, and he said, uh, he said, uh, how you get along, Billy? I said, fine. So here he'd been out in the meetings. I said, yes, I'm out in the meetings. I was telling him about, a fellow said to me, he said, say, you're a preacher. What are you doing hanging around these businessmen? I said, I am a businessman. <laughs> and they said, oh, what business you in? I said, uh, assurance business. <laughs> and see, he didn't get it. And I never said insurance. I said assurance. <laughs> and so I said assurance business. He said, oh, I, said, I see. He said, uh, what, um, what insurance do you sell? <laughs> I said, I sell uh, eternal life assurance. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still selling. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd be in, if any of you are interested, I'd like to talk the policy with you right after the meeting. <laughs> it's all right. So he, he said, uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, the eternal life said, I don't believe I ever heard of the company. I said, oh, you know, I said, it's well known. And he said, uh, I said, it's an old establishment. And he said, uh, he said, where's the headquarters? I said, in glory. <laughs> <laughs> Wilmer said to me, he said, Billy, I thought I'd come up and sell you some insurance that I hear they don't have any insurance. And I said, oh, yes, I, I have insurance. And he said, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. He said, I guess your brother, uh, uh, you have it with him. I said, no, not exactly with him. My wife looked at me as if, she said, well, you must be uh, telling a story. She knew I didn't have any insurance, but she didn't get it either. I said, assurance, not insurance. He said, uh, what insurance do you have, Billy? I said, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory and divine. I'm an heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. He said, Billy, that's very nice. 
That's very nice. So, uh, nothing against that, but so that will put you up here in this graveyard when you're gone. I said, he'll get me out. I'm not worried about getting in. <clears throat> I'm not bothered about getting in, it's getting out. <laughs> so this is the only thing I know will get you out. So if you're interested in getting out, let us talk to you about it. Looking up on the audience this morning, I won't keep you just a little bit. And I had a text I was going to preach from, so then I thought, well, I better not do that. I'd just go to have a little drama of something, a character in the Bible. And thinking here, oh, into serious matters, that while we're sitting here as Christians, I suppose most of us, did you know this may be the last time that we'll ever eat breakfast together? Did you ever think of that? And do you realize what little words that I have to say here? God's going to make me answer for it up there at the Day of Judgment. See? And I have souls here, no matter if it's a small group, but yet I have, it's the words that I say, well, I'll have to answer for them up there. So we may never eat another breakfast together, but I hope we eat a supper together someday. Yeah. That's the last supper up there with Him. It'll be the first one there. And then as we sit here this morning, and I look upon these men here, and some of them great ministers who studied, and me here just a, a bushman come out, no education, sitting here, a man is qualified to preach and doctors of divinity. I feel very little to stand talk before a man like that. But yet I, I got to express what I feel. And their great gratitude and kindness to let me stand and do this. I appreciate it, brothers. Cooperating in the meeting and getting together, I'm here to help you. I'm going to do everything I can for each one of you, by the grace of God. And then when it's all over someday, if I don't get to eat breakfast with you again, when it's all over, sitting across the table from one another, that's the time I'm looking for. No doubt what little tears will run down our cheeks and look across the table and get each other by the hand. It'll mean something then. Let's work while it's time to work, yes, while the sun's up. It'll be down after a while. It's getting very low. Then to think that while we're sitting there holding each other's hands and weeping a little, then the great king will come out and all of his great robes. Come down along the line, wipe all tears away from our eyes, and says, Well done, my good and faithful servants. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. While the sun's up and it's light enough to labor, let's labor. Now this little texture may seem kind of ridiculous. But we're going to talk on this subject. He was to pass this way. It must have been a, an awful night on the little fella. He couldn't sleep at all. He just rolled and tossed all night long. It's breaking day, and we all know what those restless nights mean. You can't sleep. You've got something on your mind. Or something's got your nerves all upset. And this little fellow was a businessman. Maybe in a city of Jericho, which is something like you businessmen and women here. And he, um, he no doubt had a growing business. He stood in good with the, all the clubs and so forth and was a, a member of the church, the Sanhedrin Council, and had a fine priest. And he believed this priest. And the strange thing about this case, though, is his wife, we'll call her Rebecca, she had strayed off on the wrong side, he thought. So did the priest. She was following a man that was supposed to be a prophet of Nazareth. A man named Jesus. The people, the poor class of people, believed him to be a prophet. Or a Messiah that was promised, but it didn't meet just the qualifications of the Sanhedrin. Strange, sometimes God does things off of the color that we think it ought to be in. This fellow, you see, was born, to their opinion, an uh, illegitimate birth. His mother gave birth to him before her and her husband was married. Another thing, he had no schooling. They didn't have no record of ever going to school. He was not a priest. Neither was he a rabbi. He just had claims like of his own. His brother Don so greatly stated this morning, it was a turning corner. They didn't recognize it. It usually happens that way. Come to that corner time. But somehow or another, his wife had been persuaded 
that he was that prophet that was to come. And she had followed him, believed him, and she had tried to tell her husband, but he was so carried away in his business. And with the, he belonged to church, isn't that good enough? Something like the rich young ruler, you know, he had a business also, but he realized and he was a, a member of the church, but he didn't have eternal life. And he has, he seen something in Jesus that other man didn't have. And he said, come to him and said, I, you wanted to know if he, what he could do to have eternal life. And Jesus told him, keep the commandments. He said, I've done this since it was a youth. See, it showed he was a, a believer. But he knew that Jesus had something that those priests and rabbis didn't have. And when a man ever comes in contact with Jesus Christ, he's different from man. You're never the same when you once see him. It is any spark of God about you. So Rebecca had found this Jesus, and he, he was to her exactly the fulfilling of the promise that the Jews had been looking for for their day. So the news that got around that he was going to have a, a breakfast or some kind of a dinner or something down in Jericho. So it, she had got busy to praying about her businessman husband. Uh, we need more Rebecca's everywhere. So you see, prayer changes things. If you lay your husband or your unsaved one before God and then pray, God will make a way somewhere because He promised to. So that's what Rebecca, being a staunch believer and a follower of the Lord Jesus and a very fine, sweet person she must have been, she had uh, interested in her household. I think it, that reflects again that if, if a person ever meets Jesus and finds Him really in your heart, you're interested not only in your own household, but the household of God everywhere. Yeah. You're interested if they know Him. And to know Him is life. Know Him. You not know how to read the Word, or so, but know Him is life. So she prayed hard, and the day grew close to when Jesus was supposed to enter the city. No doubt, but the day before she might have seen if his attitude had changed any. So she said, uh, maybe Zacchaeus, are, are you going to that uh, breakfast in the morning? Why, certainly not. Why, that bunch of people, and you expect me? I've got the best restaurant in town. They hold it over at Levinsky's. I hope there's not a Levinsky here. But uh, anyhow, over at the other place, you see. And why, I got the best place in town. They picked that place down there. Well, they ought, they ought to come to my place to hold this, you see. He wasn't going. Then she got to praying really desperately. So then that night, the little fellow couldn't rest at all. You know, there's something about it. If you go to really desperately praying about something, God works on both ends of the line. Yes. He, he, he answers. So the little fella must have got to thinking that night, wonder if I should go down and, and, and hear this man. Now Rebecca says that he's a prophet. Now we know we haven't had any prophets for hundreds of years. And I asked the priest about it. He said, nothing but just the nonsense. If there'd be a prophet raised up, wouldn't he come through the church? That's the way it'd have to come. He'd come to us Pharisees or Sadducees or our group or he wouldn't be a prophet. You know, that attitude still holds. <laughs> so they think it has to come that way or it isn't right. right. So they said, no doubt, but in this great time, and she believed it anyhow, and he had discussed it with the priest. The priest said, now look here. Them days of prophets have been many, many years ago. We've got the law. We've got it all wrote out. The situation's under control, and we've got it in our hands, and we know about these things. But then, of course, Zacchaeus, not looking into it, just absolutely just... Presuming, taking it for granted. The word presume is to venture without authority. Why, he, uh, he thought that that was all right. As long as he belonged to the church, that's all he had to do. But then as night began to come on, there come a sudden desire in his heart. Maybe if this person is in town, he may never be here again. I should go and investigate the, the situation. See for myself. Now that's a good idea. Look it over yourself. Don't go to criticize. Take the word and examine the word by it. So she, Rebecca had tried as a woman could to explain that what the prophets had said and what Moses had said this person would be and when he comes. So she must have thought, tried to explain it to him, but yet the priest had much more influence over him than what Rebecca, his wife, did. 
Then when morning began to dawn, why, the little fellow was, Rebecca, I can imagine her, seen her punch him, said, Zacchaeus, you mean to say you don't want to go down? No, I don't want nothing to do with it. You know, and don't be re- don't be disgusted, Rebecca. Sometimes that's a good sign. See, just, just when he gets so discouraged to talk about it and everything else, that's a pretty good sign sometimes. So, after a while, Rebecca act like she's asleep, only she was praying. And she finds Zacchaeus slips out of bed real easy. <laughs> and um, goes over and grooms himself all up and combs his hair just right and puts on his best garment. And she peeped over out of one eye to see what he was doing. She knew right then God had answered prayer. She knew something was going to take place. So Zacchaeus tiptoes out, not letting Rebecca know where he's going, you know. And he slips out, gets outside and looks back. She raises up the curtain, looks out to see him going out. She says, thank you, Lord. It's all all right now. See, like Elijah did when he said, I see that the cloud the size of a man's hand, just the first little evidence, something's fixing to happen. So he goes out and down the street. She said, now I understand he's going to enter in by the south gate. So I better go over there and stand. He said, now I'll get me a place and I'll stand right there. And when he comes in, I'll see how much profit that fellow is. <laughs> and I'm going to walk right out and put my finger under his nose. And I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And when he comes and I'm going to tell him that all of his nonsense has caused my wife and these prayer meetings and things. I'm getting sick and tired of it. I'm going to, I'm going to say something about this. I'll tell him, and then I know Rabbi will certainly pat me on the back and say, Zacchaeus, you're a good member of this church. You're, you're certainly a fine fellow. So he said, I'll get down there early. So he got down when he got about a block or two of the gate. Come to find out, the place was jammed. It was hanging on the walls and everywhere. Somehow or another, even though he was talked about, there was somebody still like to hear him. Somebody would listen. So he said, now, how am I going to ever see him come in the gate? You remember the Bible said he was small, statue. And uh, he said, I'm too little. So he pushed around, here, give me a little room. You can tell he isn't a Christian yet. Just, he acting like that. Christians don't have that attitude. See? Stand back. You know who I am? I'm Zacchaeus. I own the restaurant up here. Stand out of my way. See, now, that ain't a Christian. Everybody knows he wasn't. Maybe some of them knew that Rebecca was praying. Well, he said, well, you stand back. And so he knew he'd never get to see him in all that crowd, so he wouldn't be able to express his thoughts to him. So he thought, well, now, what will I do? Maybe I'll go back home and just forget the whole matter. But you know, there's something about it. That when you make up your mind that you want to see him, there's nothing going to stop you from seeing him. I don't care what it is. You're, you're persistent. And uh, like the little uh, Greek woman was persistent to get to Jesus. And... There's something about it that whenever you make up your mind that you're going to see him, there is nothing going to stop you. But remember, when you make up your mind, then the devil's going to do everything he can to stop you. He's determined that you're not going to understand it. You're not going to see it. He'll throw every black sheet across he can to keep you from seeing it. So there was his first barricade right there. So then he started off and said, well, I guess, and looked over there, and there stood some of his competitors. And they, he knew then that some of the folks from the church. So there he had made so much fun of this Jesus of Nazareth and being a prophet. Then here stood his, some of his members looking at him right down there in the same group. He just couldn't be hid. He was identified. Zach, is here already identified. <laughs> just, you know, if there happened to be one here, you're already mixed up in the group now. So they already know we're here, so we just might as well get acquainted. No one had it. So he said, well, this is... Ah, here you look around, see one standing here. You know, after all, they're all about like you. They they want to find out something. A man knows that he come from somewhere, from the beyond, and when he leaves, he goes back somewhere. Yeah. And he's always trying to find something to find out where he come from and where is he going. There's only one who has that answer. That's God. Every man wants to look over that curtain. And when you see anything that can show you what's over the curtain, where you've been, who you are, and where you're going. There's only one book of all the literature that's wrote to the millions of tons. This is the book that tells you who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. There's no other book that'll do it, that Bible. And the Word is God, the Bible said. Now we find that this fellow with all around, he was embarrassed to find out he was in the midst of a people that 
were screaming and crying and hollering and acting like they were crazy. So, but he, there he was sitting identified with them. So he, he just had to stay. That's all there was to it. Now he said, well, if I've come this far, I might as well go on until I really find him out. Now, Zacchaeus, that's a good idea. You done got here at the breakfast, so now let's just go on, see, with all this far. So now we find out that uh, as they went along, he said, now, if I stay here, I, I cannot see him because I'm too small. So, you know, I believe I'll get out of this crowd and run down on the corner uh, where I'll be standing by myself, get me a place right on the, the edge of the pavement. And when he comes by, then I'll walk right out in the street and tell him what I think of him. I'll give him a piece of my mind. So he took off with the crowd and went down. He thought, now, which way will he go? Well, he went down to Hallelujah Avenue. That's usually the way he travels. You see? And went down to Amen Corner, where it turns there to go down to the, to the eating place. That's where you go, you know, Hallelujah Avenue and Amen Corner, and then you're ready to eat the word. <laughs> so he went down to this corner and stood there on the corner and said, now, there's nobody here. And when I... I know it sounds ridiculous, but I... Just, hold on a minute. So then... First thing you know, he got down to this corner and he said, there's nobody here, so I'll stand here. When he comes by, I'll find out how much profit he is. I'll walk right out in the street and I'll tell him something. So he's standing there and he happened to get to thinking, now just a minute. You know, if I was too small, down there that crowd will probably go wherever he's going. I, I don't want nobody hollering when I talk to him. I want to tell him so he'll hear me. And them hollering, Amen, Hallelujah, Glory to God, Hosanna to the, uh, to the prophet that comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, uh, they'll never hear me, all that noisy bunch. So there's only one thing that they'll crowd all around me and then I, I, I can't even see him at all. So he had to look standing on the corner and there was an old familiar sycamore tree. That's a good Indiana tree. So uh, standing on the corner and he thought, well, if I could get up there on that limb and sit down, then I'd be up there. Then I could really tell him when he comes by. So he comes to run over. He's too small. He couldn't get up to the limb. So he said, well, now there's only one thing I can do. And there sat the, the city garbage can sitting on the corner. So he thought, well, now if I go over and get that garbage can and uh, pick it up and bring it over here, then I can get the rest of the way up the tree from that. That'll help me. So he goes over and the garbage disposal hadn't come by yet that morning. It was pretty heavy. So he's small and he couldn't pick it up. The only one way to do it, that's wrap his arms around it. And he had on his best garment. <laughs> so you know, it's always hindrances when you're trying to see Jesus. But uh, that didn't make any difference whether he's good garment or not. He wanted to see Jesus anyhow. So he throwed his arm around the garbage can. <laughs> so he could get over there. So he scooted it over and there he had garbage all over him. Well, didn't make any difference. He, he wanted to see him anyhow. So while he was pushing the can over with his arms around, he heard somebody laughing. And he looked around, and it wasn't Levinsky standing here, his competitor. <laughs> saying, well, what do you know? Zacchaeus has become, got him a new job from his restaurant. He's working for the garbage disposal. <laughs> you know, the devil just wants to see what he can do to throw everything in yeah. your way that yeah. he can to keep you from seeing Jesus. He'll tell you they're a bunch of holy rollers. They'll tell you they're a bunch of idiots. He'll say there, there's nothing to them. They're just the poor trash of the city. Anything he can do. But if you're determined to see him, God will make a way for you to see him. Just keep that in your mind. Something will take place if that hunger begins to break into your heart. Something, you'll go see him anyhow. So, didn't make any difference. His little old face turned red and he was embarrassed. But he just pushed the can on over anyhow and got a hold of it and shinned it up the tree. It's all right, isn't it? You Southerners know what shit it is. And climbed up the tree, got up the tree, and he got up there, and he found where two limbs come together and met in the trunk of the tree. And there he sat down. Now, that's a good place to sit, where two ways meets, yours and God's, your idea and his. That's a good time to sit down and think it over. Your own thoughts about him and what his word says he is. What you think he is and what the word says he is. What the message of the hour is to your thinking, what the message of the hour is to His Word. That's the difference. Yeah. Sit there and think it over a little while. No doubt, Satan got on one of his shoulders. He said, you know what? You are a pretty looking sight. Sitting up here picking splinters out of your hands. And with your best garment on, and it all garbage all over it. 
And now your name will be published all through the city. The jokes will be all on you because look what a rational thing you have done. Satan. See, Satan, when you make a start, then he'll try to tell you made an error. There he sat in that condition. He said, well, Rebecca said he was a prophet. I'll give him a trial. I'll see if he's a prophet. Now, he said, when he comes by here, I'll just disguise myself. and He'll never know I'm up here. First, I'll get a look at him. And then when I see him, then I'm going to jump out of this tree. And then I'll go down there and tell him. Now, said, now, if he, uh, if he is a prophet, oh, as Rebecca said that he was, he might know I was up in this tree, if that's true. So I'll tell you, I'll fix him up. So he pulled all the leaves around him and disguised himself all over so he couldn't be seen and left one leaf to look out, you know, to see him as he turned the corner. And then uh, sitting there, thinking it all over, after a while he heard a noise coming around the corner. It's strange. Wherever he's at, there's always a lot of noise. You know, right. noise is a sign of life. Yeah. Remember the high priest when he dressed and went into the Holy of Holies? On the end of his garment, he had a pomegranate and a bell. And that noise in the Holy of Holies was the only way the waiters knew that he was alive or not. Yes. It made a noise. And where there ain't no noise, then he might be dead. But I think that's what's a whole lot to matter our churches today. There's not enough noise about it. Not enough enthusiasm. Not enough something. And so, where Jesus is, there's always a noise. One time when he would come into Jerusalem, they were screaming and hollering and, Hosanna to the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. And some of those priests stand there said, Why, make them keep still, hold their peace. He said, If they hold their peace, the rocks will cry out. Something has to move when he's around. Notice, and then those who believe him. And then he heard this noise of coming around the corner and screaming and going on. So he thought, well, he must be approaching. So he pulled up his leaf and raised up, look over. I've got him all now. We'll find out how much profit he is. So while he was sitting there with his leaf up looking and, and up in this tree, way up above their heads where they passed beneath the tree. So when... He noticed the first man coming around the corner must have been the Apostle Peter because he was a big, strong, burly sort of a man. I can see him pushing the crowds back saying, Friends, I'm sorry. Our master had a great service last night. Much virtue has gone from him. You all will understand. Would you just stand aside so master can pass by? Uh, please do that. Here come Matthew, Mark, and them along and say, Now, nah, we, we don't want to be rude. We're, we're not here for that purpose. But our master is awfully tired and he hasn't had his breakfast. So we're, we're, we want you to stand aside, if you will. There was a, a man standing there that maybe Zach just took a look at. A few days before that, at a, one of the meetings at a business place, uh, a doctor had been there and told this little fella that had a little girl that was real sick of a fever. And she wasn't going to live. His son, he'd done all he could do for her. And Zacchaeus, when he raised his leaf up, look, he seen this man with this baby wrapped in this blanket coming around the corner. He thought, what a rational thing that that father would do. Trying to follow that, that so-called prophet. Here he coming around the corner with this baby in it with a fever and standing out in this wind. But you know, just as Zacchaeus, when you really believe, there's nothing going to hinder you. you and she wanted to get that baby to him. And every time they'd make a, a corner or change, he'd be pushed back. But he, he was persistent. He was going on. Finally, at this corner, the little mother run out with a baby in her arms. And she must have fell down. And she said, Lord, be merciful to my child. And there stood the father of the baby, crying to, which was a friend to Zacchaeus. He said, what's changed his attitude? So he couldn't make out who the man was, yet he was down in the crowd. All at once he sees a hand stretch out and touch over the top of this little blanket, and the little girl was unwrapped and went skipping down the street. Now there's got to be something to that, Zacchaeus said. Finally he come in view, and one look at him, Zacchaeus had done changed his opinion. Just one glimpse of him. There he was. He didn't look like there was something different about him. Meek, gentle, kind, and yet looked like if he'd speak, the world would come to an end. He was a different character from what he had thought. 
His attitude begin to, all of his starch begin to wash out when he's seen him. He comes walking on down the street. He thought, over this little leaf looking over, see what was taking place. And as he walked, he got right under to where he was. And he said, you know, that man could be a prophet. Maybe Rebecca was right. She might know more about the scriptures than I did. So he walked right on down, with his head down, walking along, humble, gentle, as he always did to the disciples, keeping the people out of his way. And as he got right out of the tree, he stopped. Zach is looking over the leaves, something like that. He looked up in the tree. said, Zacchaeus, come on down. Not only did he know is is up in the tree, but he knowed his name. Was Zacchaeus. That's right. He had a lot less trouble getting down out of the tree than he did getting up. <laughs> he knowed him. The miracle was done on him. See, he said, Lord... I've been wrong. I'm ready to confess I'm wrong. If I've took anything that's wrong, I'll, I'll pay it back. I'll give half my goods to the poor. Jesus said today, salvation has come to your house. What changed you? What was the change, brother and sister? Think just for a moment. The change was he had seen something real. He had heard all the promises that had been made. The priest talking about what was. Great prophet Moses. Great this, that, or the other. Promising a great something in the future. But ignoring what's being done now. That's the way of man. He saw something genuine. Something that he could see himself. The miracle had happened to him. He was that prophet. Because he didn't know him. Neither would he ever seen him up in the tree. But when he got right under the tree, he stopped and looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. Today salvation has come to your house. Brethren, it's the real thing that changes man's mind, yes. changes their attitude. Sometimes it's a press, surely, to get to it. But if you approach Christ this morning with, with the, the thought in your heart that I will not be critical, but I'll study the Scripture and see what He was. If you come to the meeting tonight, before you come, study and see what He was. Yes. Whatever He was, He has to be the same today. Yes. His, as I spoke last night, if many of you were there, see, as God identify Himself by His characteristic, He always must remain that way because He's the same yesterday and today and forever. Yes. Man's hearts are, are so... Uh, a real God-fearing man or woman, businessman or whatever it is. He's always, there's something in his heart. If there's any God-fear about him, to know something about God. Say, I never told you what happened to Zacchaeus. He'd become a member of the full gospel businessman's chapter of Jericho. They, uh, I want to tell you about him first. See. Well, sure, he wouldn't be nothing else but full gospel. Of course not. That's all Jesus uh, preached. So he become a member there. You ought to be a member of the same. Now, notice. But he wanted to see something real. And when he saw something real himself that was scripturally identified, then he was ready. It's the real things that mounts. Just a little story for closing. How many in here is hunters? Let's see your hands. My brethren in here, oh my, I know it wasn't alone. So, I love to hunt. And I, I used to go up in the north woods up in New Hampshire. It's the home of the white-tailed deer. How I love to hunt them. And I used to go up every year and I had a partner up there named Bert Call. One of the finest men I ever hunted with. And my Nature's always been to the woods. I was born in the woods, and I just seemed like I was raised up there. And even my conversion never took it out of me. Not so much to get the game, but just to be in the woods. I think God is there. To see him, how he moves, and the nature, how it dies, and goes down, comes back again. And resurrection. The sun comes up of the morning, a little baby born. And then about 9 o'clock it goes to school. About 10 o'clock it's finished. At 12 o'clock it's in its strength. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's getting along uh, about my age. At 5 o'clock, it's 80 years old. It's dying. It goes down. It served God's purpose. It ain't dead. It'll come back the next morning. It's God testifying. There is a life, death, burial, resurrection. Watch them trees out there. Last fall, the sap went down into the root before any frost or anything else come. What was it doing? Going down into the grave. What happens then? 
comes back again in the spring. It isn't dead. It goes down and lays in the ground, comes back. If it stays up, then the winter will kill it. See, God has no intelligence of its own, sends it down there. It's God's provided way. Yes. So it just follows God's provided way. It goes down, hides in the winter, comes back again with new life next year, testifying there is a life, death, burial, resurrection. Yes. Everywhere yes. it's the same thing. God, in His great creation, testifying of Himself. This hunter is a fine shot, a good shot. But he was the most cruelest man I ever met. He, he made fun of me all the time. He shot fawns. Now, not it's wrong to shoot a fawn if the law says so. But, you know, Abraham killed a calf and fed it to God. So it wasn't the, the sect or the, the size. It's the attitude. He'd shoot him just because it made me feel bad. And he'd say, oh, you're chicken-hearted like the other than priest. He said, Billy, you'd be a good hunter if it wasn't you as a preacher. And said, but you're too chicken-hearted. That's the way them preachers said. They're, they're too chicken-hearted. And I said, Bert, you're cruel. He had eyes like a lizard anyhow. And he said, and did he, like the women try to paint their eyes, you know, up like that. And he said, you look over like that. And he said, you're just chicken-hearted. So he'd shoot those little pawns and kill one, let it lay, and go right on and get another one just to make me feel bad. He said, I'll get you away from that preaching some of these days. And I said, no, oh, no, Bert. No, no. So one day I went up there one fall, and it was late. And a season had been in about a week, and I was busy. I was a state game warden of Indiana, and I, I had been busy and right in hunting season, so I had to get my vacation. I went up a little late, and uh, those white-tailed deer, if they're ever shot at, and you talk about Houdini being an escape artist, my, he's an amateur to them. And so then they really stay hid. And it had been moonlight nights, snow on the ground about six inches, trailing. Uh, work. So Bert, when he came down to the cabin where I was at, he said, Say, Billy, I got a good one this year for you. And I said, What? Reached down his pocket and pulled out. He had a little whistle. He'd blow it, and it sounded just like a little fawn crying for its mother. A little baby deer, no crying for its mother. I said, Bert, how cruel can you be? I said, you mean you wouldn't do a thing like that? It's ha ha, you chicken-hearted preacher. And uh, we went on hunting that day, and we went up over the Jefferson Notch, and you didn't have to worry about him. He knew how to find his way back. So we climbed up to about noon, and then we'd separate and go one one way and one the other. And then if we got our deer, we'd hang him up, and, and then we'd get our horses and go get him. So we got about 11 o'clock. We hadn't even seen a track, not one track. All the deer were laying down. They get in the brush and under the brush piles and things where the tops of the trees where the loggers had been. And they would uh, they was hide and stay away because they'd been shot at. They were scared. About 11 o'clock, Bert stopped, sat down. There's a little opening about all the size of this building and in the inside maybe twice the size. A little opening there. And he sat down. And he reached back to get, I thought, his, his thermos that he had in his coat. We usually carry a thermos and have some hot chocolate uh, because it's got fuel to it, you know, and then have a sandwich. Now, we separate. We was getting up high towards Timberline, so I thought maybe that Bert was going to have his sandwich. So he sat down to pull out this thermos, and uh, I thought he was going to pull it out. And I just let, set my gun down against the tree and started at your mind. But what he was, he was getting that little whistle out. So when he got this little whistle out, he blew it. And anyone ever heard of a little old baby fawn cry? It's kind of pitiful anyhow. And when he blew that whistle, to my surprise, right across from him, a great big mother doe stood up. Now, a doe is the mother deer. So she stood up. There was her big brown eyes, and these, these big ears pointed right up like that. See, her baby was in trouble. And he blew it again. And she looked around. And she walked right out into that opening. Now, that's unusual. Any of you hunters know that for a deer to do that. She walked out there. I could see her big eyes. She wasn't standing over 20 yards from me. And I thought, oh, Bert, you can't do that. And it killed that poor, precious mother. Her looking for her baby and you deceiving her like that. And this whistle had blown and she, was, she walked out there. And the hunter raised the lever on his 306 rifle, dropped it down, that cocked the gun, you know, with the safety off. And she heard that. And she looked around. And she saw the hunter. Her ears peeked right down. Usually they'd been gone. And she would have walked out there in the first place at that time of day. But you see, she was a mother. There was something in her. She, something genuine. Something she wasn't putting on no show. She was a mother. She was born a mother. And her baby was in trouble. That was to her interest. 
And he looked up at me with those lizard-looking eyes and was grinning. I said, Bert, don't do it. Don't do it. He just grinned, turned around that rifle. Oh, my, he's a dead shot. And I know when that scope hair come across her loyal, motherly heart, he'd blow it plumb through her. See, she wasn't standing 20 yards, big 180 grand, green, 180 grain mushroom bullet in there. He would just blow her heart plumb through both sides. I thought, how can you be so cruel? as to blow that precious mother's heart out of her and her seeking her baby. How can you do that, Bert? I was thinking to myself. I seen his arms study down. I couldn't look at it. I just couldn't do it. I turned my back. I, I couldn't see that. That genuine, loyal mother standing there. She wasn't a hypocrite. She wasn't just putting it on for a sideshow. She was a mother. That's what she's doing. Death didn't mean nothing to her. The baby was in trouble. She thought more of her baby than she did of her own life. Let the hunter shoot whatever it was. Her loyal heart was beaten. Her motherhood, the motherhood in her was calling. Her baby was crying. There was something inside of her pulsating. It was real. And how could that cruel hunter blow that loyal heart out? I just couldn't see it. I turned my head. I thought, Lord God, don't let him do it. I stand like this. I couldn't hear. I didn't want to hear the gunfire. It was just too much. I waited. The gun never fired. And I turned around and looked, and it's going like this. He couldn't do it. He turned around and looked at me, and those big eyes had changed. Tears was running down his cheeks. He looked at me, and his lips quivering. He threw the gun on the snowbank, and grabbed me into a trouser leg. He said, "Billy, I've had enough of it." Lead me to that Jesus you're talking about. <laughs> there on that snowdrift, I led him to the Lord Jesus. Why? He saw something real. He'd been to all kinds of churches. He'd seen something that wasn't put on. He'd seen something that was genuine. Friends, we might have church rules and church regulations and theologies and everything else. But there's a real, genuine Jesus. Let's look to Him just now as we bow our head. With your heads bowed, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, your heart's bowed too. How many in here? Now, do who profess Christian who does not? If a profession is all you have. But how many of you would like to be as much Christian as that dear was a mother? Was something so genuine in you? It seemed more than your life or anything that you have. And you say, may say this, Brother Branham, I belong to church. I'm a businessman, businesswoman, or want more housewife. But really, to be that type of a Christian and I could lay the whole world aside, stand the criticism or anything, I, I'd like to be as much, I'd like to be in my heart a Christian as that dear was a mother. With your heads bowed now and your eyes closed, before God, I ask you in Christ's name, at the ending of the age, would you just put up your hand? I can't make an altar call because there's no room. But just say, pray for me, Brother Branham, that I will be a type of a Christian as that dear was a mother. God bless you. There's just hands everywhere. Let me be as much Christian as Zach is, when you put your hand up, that shows he's found you. Now, won't you slide right out of the tree? He'll go home with you today for dinner. He'll stay with you the rest of your days. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the Lord Jesus, His presence. We're aware that there's something here that made men and women, some of them even professed to be Christians for years. But there was, there's something present that calls them, even though they be professed, even as Zacchaeus was, but wants to touch from Christ. They've lifted their hand as a testimony that something inside of them told them to do it. Let them know just now that's Jesus. He was to pass this way this morning. And He has. There was, I guess, some 150 hands up, Lord. I pray that you'll visit each one 
and give to them the reality that it is to be a real Christian. No matter how much the world tries to discourage us and how much that others try to discourage us, let us know that it's a fight to get there. It's an effort we have to put forth. But when connecting with something that's genuine, real, it changes us then. I pray that you'll change every heart, Lord, and make everyone in divine presence at this time put the Holy Spirit in their life to be as much Christian as uh, Mother Dear was a mother. She was born a mother. And may they be born of the Spirit of God and become a real follower of Jesus Christ. May they come from their sycamore trees today. Grant it, Lord. May you go home with each one of us and there abide with us until the time you come to take us to our eternal home. Or we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you kindly. The Lord bless you. I kept you late. I was supposed to be out of here at 10 o'clock. It's 10 minutes till 11. I hope that God takes these few little crude words, nervous and upset, leaves them in your heart. Remember, there is something genuine about Christ. God bless you. All right.